and uh, and uh, the asset endowment was not that great because there are people in displacement. Uh, as I, I mentioned that we randomized people into, two, into four arms of the study, uh, the randomization was uh, based on pub, uh, public lottery, uh, not done by computers usually in uh, the economic literature. However, even with public lottery, we get nearly uh, balanced uh, arms, and therefore we can say that uh, any effect in the short-term follow-up or the long-term follow-up is uh, due to the variations in the arms of the study. So to estimate the treatment effects, we rely on uncover uh, specifications whereby uh, we, we use the, the installment arms, that the one, the people who receive the small amount in two, in two tranches uh, as our control group. Uh, we don't have a pure control group for this study uh, because uh, it, it was not ethical at that point because there was a, a, a drought that was uh, just being declared. So uh, we ran an cover specification to uh, show both the midline, uh, that is just the three months follow up, and two, uh, three and a half years later the end line follow up. So we interact with the treatment and uh, the treatment arms and the follow up survey arms. The, the follow up and the treatment arms, we interact with them and therefore. We report both the midline uh, effects as well as the endline effects that is uh, three and a half years later. Uh, because we are testing more multiple hypotheses, we adjust uh, the values for false discovery rate uh, using uh, West Young step down procedure. So, into our results, what we are uh, more interested in is the issues of labor and earnings. And from this uh, table, uh, what we see is that. Um, Receiving a cash transfer either in one installment or a bigger chunk of money uh, does not increase the probability that members engage in, um, in, in any income generating activity. However, uh, we see some slight changes, some slight reduction in terms of engagement in wage work. And this is because the existing wage works, that point of, of study, who are not really desirable. They are quite uh, have bad terms in terms of the earnings, and therefore, when you take some more money into uh, people's pockets, uh, what they do is they switch off away from the wage work. Uh, what is more interesting is farm uh, business outcomes, whereby uh, what we see at three months after the cash transfers. Um, People you give the amount of money, uh, the, the, the people who are receiving the small amount of money uh, are Elita, in one. Just, yes. Just to let you know, you have five minutes left. Yes, yes. So, small amount of money in two installments versus one installment, what we see is that the act of combining the, the money, the same amount of money increases the, the likelihood of earning business, uh, earning from business by 15 percentage points. However, even uh, whenever you the recipient was receiving the large cash transfer, the effect size is nearly uh, the same as a small amount of money. Uh, when we do a follow-up survey like three years later, what we get is the effect of earnings from non-farm business uh, remains the same, like it's almost this identical as it uh, it was at uh, the, the short term follow up. Now, the next set of results we look at if these firms or if, if these families were investing in business, then we should, refl should reflect in the size of their business. And therefore, we look at the value of their investments. And as the previous table showed, uh, we see a large injection in terms of uh, the size of the business for those people who are investing in. For those people who are receiving large transfers, and then uh, we also see some thirty dollars gain uh, for those people who receive uh, money in one transfer as opposed to two uh, other installments. When we do the follow up uh, 
three and a half years later, we can't make a distinction between those who are receiving large transfers and those who are receiving uh, medium transfers. And the same story can be said about the profit margins. Uh, you make $20 when you receive large transfers and $9 when you receive uh, uh, medium-sized transfers, but smaller transfers, we don't see any gains. And when we do a, a year follow-up, then we are making the same amounts of profit. So in, in conclusion, what we do is um, we run a, a, an RCT in the context of Somalia, and this is an under research settings, and we deliver a cash transfers by deliver by varying the uh, um, the frequency of delivery and the size of the transfers. And uh, what we show is that lumping uh, delivering the cash transfers in terms of uh, one. Uh, one installment instead of doing like several other installment increases the likelihood of owning a, a business by 15 percentage points. However, that small amount of transfers uh, fades away and when we do the long term follow up, but those who receive larger chunks of transfers, uh, they are still maintaining the lead in terms of ownership of transfers. Uh, when we do some cost benefit analysis, what we, in terms of both the, the size of the investments as well as the profit earnings, what we get is that uh, the medium size uh, uh, transfers is cost effective than the large transfers, uh, both in terms of the enterprise net worth or the business value or uh, the profits that are realized from those investments. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this very timely presentation and for the, the great set of results. Uh, now we are moving to uh, Ima Riley. Do you want to share, uh, Ima? Do you want to start to share your screen? Great. You see that, right? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. Um, so this um, project is looking at using an information campaign to encourage the adoption of a new financial technology in Ghana. Uh, my name is Emma Riley. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Washington, and this is joint with Abu Shan Choi from Florida International University. So this study is motivated by the idea of how do we um, teach people about new technologies? How do we encourage people to adopt and use new technologies? And one of the key um, areas that's been explored in the literature of technology adoption is the idea of lack of information or lack of awareness of a technology as being a key obstacle to people starting to use something. And a lot of papers um, target sort of lack of knowledge and lack of awareness by using face-to-face -face or peer-based information transmission, where they either sort of sit people down, either on their own or in groups, and train them in a new technology, um, or they teach key people in a community how to use a new technology um, and then um, ask those people to transmit it to others in that, their community or social network. But the problem with these face-to-face -face methods of sort of information transmission is that they're very slow and they're also expensive to scale up. And the rapid adoption of mobile phones actually promises a, a different method of spreading awareness of new technologies. So you could use mobile phones to send information directly to people's phones, telling them about a, a new technology um, and the benefits of that new technology. And a lot of studies recently have tried to look at um, using text messages in particular as a way to send information very, very cheaply and at scale to people about new technologies. But in this study, we're going to look at a, a slightly different um, approach, which is interactive voice response messages, where interactive voice response you can think of as sort of building upon text messages, but instead of sending people a written message to their, their phone, you actually um, send a voice call to someone's phone such that when they pick up that voice call, they hear a pre-recorded message about something. And the advantage of this is that firstly, SMS messages are not effective for illiterate populations. And secondly, you don't really know how well people are engaged with a text message. You don't know if they read it. You don't know if they just deleted it. Whereas if they actually pick up a call, you can track sort of did they pick it up? Did they listen to this call? So we're going to look at whether we can use these interactive voice response message systems to actually increase awareness and adoption of a new technology. 
And the technology that we're going to consider here <clears throat> is mobile banking services. And you can think of mobile banking services as basically connecting <clears throat> a, mobile, a mobile money account directly to a bank account. So mobile money services work on very basic mobile phones. So you don't need a smartphone, you don't need internet or, or data um, or apps or anything like that to use mobile money services. They work on very basic mobile phones over the cellular um, data signal. A mobile money allows you to um, deposit money to your phone by going to a mobile money agent and giving them cash. You then get e-money on your mobile money wallet and you can then send that e-money to another mobile phone. So what mobile banking services are gonna be doing is instead of just being able to send money from your phone to another phone, now you can send money from your mobile money wallet directly to a bank account. And you can also withdraw money from your bank account back to your mobile money wallet. So in a context like our study where banking access is extremely limited, there's high transaction costs, it's very expensive to travel to the bank and there's very few banks, mobile banking services can be thought of as dramatically increasing access to bank accounts through lowering the transaction costs of accessing a bank account. And the mobile banking service that we're gonna be looking at in particular has an extremely low cost so it only has a fixed cost of 16 US cents per transaction, which is extremely low cost, particularly compared to mobile money fees. So we're gonna be looking at how can we encourage people to adopt this mobile banking services. So we're gonna answer two research questions in this paper. Firstly, can providing information about these mobile banking services using interactive voice response or IVR encourage mobile banking adoption and use? And then secondly, does use of mobile banking services actually benefit clients and improve their financial behavior? So in order to do this, we use an RCT with 15,000 clients of a local bank from across Ghana, from nationally across Ghana. And we randomize these 15,000 clients equally into two different treatment arms and a control group. So the first treatment arm we call mobile banking IVR, <clears throat> Clients assigned to this treatment arm received 10 weekly voice messages, which highlighted the various benefits and features of mobile banking and contained important practical information about how do you actually use mobile banking, how do you access this service, and why might you want to use this service and how could you use it. Um, they also received some information about the importance of savings, repaying their loans, and reminders to save. Um, so this is the mobile banking IVR treatment. We then have a second treatment arm, which we call saving IVR, which the aim of which was to isolate the, the reminders to save and the salience of saving from the mobile banking IVR messages by having a series of messages which just contained saving reminders um, and general encouragement from the bank. And this is going to allow us to separate out any impacts from, from just the salience of savings or just from interaction with the bank from the actual encouragement to use mobile banking services. And then finally, we have a control group who didn't receive any IVR messages, but were free to use mobile banking services if they chose. Um, and as I mentioned, these IVR messages are particularly um, attractive for a low literacy population. Um, so just to give a brief preview um, of the results and the contribution, I'll go into the main study design. So we find that receiving IVR messages about mobile banking leads to a significant increase in use of mobile banking, um, tripling use from about 3% in the control group to 9% in the treatment group on average. And this really contributes to the literature, which has tried to highlight um, how we can use low cost scalable technologies like mobile phones um, to teach people about new technologies. And then additionally, we see that those in the mobile banking IVR group were actually more likely to repay um, a microfinance loan on time. So loan repayment rates increased by 8%, while at the same time, they were less likely um, to visit the bank while being more likely to save. So since traveling to the bank was very costly for people in this sample, <clears throat> it cost about 24 CDs on average compared to only a one CD cost of using mobile banking, using this technology constitutes a significant cost saving for this population. And so therefore benefits them by dramatically reducing transaction costs of saving. 
So this highlights generally the benefits that digital technologies can have for, for um, low income populations. So just to tell you a little bit more about the context um, of this study. So our population is all of the active saving clients of a national rural bank in Ghana that primarily served low income customers. They all were already registered for mobile banking, um, but they had not used it in the last month. Um, and that gave us a sample of 15,000 clients. We then individually randomized them um, to the two treatment for control arm. And the primary data that we use for this study is administrative data from the bank, which covers every mobile tra uh, banking transaction that took place by these clients, as well as information about their saving behavior with the bank and um, the status of any loans that they had with the bank. We also have some basic demographic information. And we complement this with a very short phone survey that asked um, a couple of, of key questions about traveling to the bank and saving behavior. But unfortunately, this is only available for um, the IVR treatment arm, so the mobile banking IVR and the savings IVR arm. And our response rate was only 10%, though it was balanced by treatment arm. So to give a bit of information about the sample, about half of the clients are female, their age about 38. They, they had small amounts of savings, this is 300 um, CDs. About half of them are from Ghana and about a third of them had a loan from the bank. Uh, in terms of compliance, because we have very, very good information from the IVR messages about who listened to a message or not, we can actually see that 90% of the people who received IVR messages listened to at least one of them and listened to the majority of at least one message. Um, two thirds listened to the majority of three or more messages. We have quite high compliance in terms of listening to these calls. So we're going to use um, an ANCOVA intention to treat specification where we pool over four months um, the administrative data from the bank and look at the impact of assignment to each of the IVR treatment arms. And then for the survey outcomes, we're just going to be comparing those in the mobile banking IVR messages to those in the saving IVR messages. Eva, so our... <laughs> just you have like five minutes left. Perfect, thank you. Um, so in terms of our... Um, our outcomes, we see um, large impacts of assignment to the mobile banking IVR treatment on use of mobile banking services. So in column one, we have any use of mobile banking in a month. In column two, the sum of the mobile banking transactions carried out in a month. And then column three, the number of mobile banking transactions done in a month. We see that those assigned to the mobile banking IVR treatment um, a six percentage points more likely to make a mobile banking transaction on a control mean of just 2% um, making a transaction in the control group. Um, they make about 30 CDs higher value transactions, about three times or four times, sorry, the control group mean of 10 CDs, and they're making about um, 0.08 additional transactions in a month. And this is all highly statistically significant and after correcting for multiple hypothesis testing, we don't see any impact of just giving savings encouragement messages on use of mobile banking, apart from a small a decrease in the number of mobile banking transactions that doesn't survive multiple hypothesis testing. So we generally think that the, the mobile banking IVR messages were successful in encouraging people to use mobile banking. When we break this down further into different kinds of mobile banking transactions, comparing any deposit to any withdrawal transaction, we see that actually the majority of the um, increase in um, use of mobile banking is coming from withdrawal transactions. So those treated with the mobile banking IVR messages were five percentage points more likely to make a withdrawal um, and just under two percentage points more likely to make a deposit transaction. Although interestingly, the increase in deposits is much larger compared to the control mean where basically nobody in their control group was, was making deposits with mobile banking. If we look at the value of transactions, and again, split this out into the sum of deposits and sum of withdrawals, and um, we see that actually the value of deposits and withdrawals is pretty similar, such that the net value added um, or subtracted to the mobile banking um, through the mobile banking plat platform is actually pretty close to zero, um, which suggests that there isn't going to be a net increase in savings from use of this mobile banking platform. 
And indeed, when we then look at the saving balance on the account, we don't see any increase in savings um, with the bank partner for either the mobile banking IVR group or the savings IVR group, although the coefficient for mobile banking IVR is, is, is sort of moderately large, it's not um, statistically significant. However, we do see a reduction in late loan repayments um, amongst clients who had a loan with this bank um, at baseline. We see a reduction um, of about two percentage points, which is about 8% of the control group mean, because um, late loan repayments were quite high during this period, um, which took place during um, 2021 on the back of the, the COVID pandemic. We also see other improvements in financial behavior amongst the mobile banking IVR clients. They're more likely to say they're saving more than 50 CDs. They're less likely to say they visited the bank in the last month, but they're more likely to say that they saved in the last month. And when we look at whether they conducted any transaction in a month at the bank, we see that clients are switching from basically doing in-person transactions and into doing mobile banking transactions, which constitutes a significant cost saving um, for those clients. So to summarize, we see that um, IVR messages can be used successfully to teach people about a new technology and encourage adoption of that technology. We see that in addition, use of mobile banking technology has improvements for the clients. They're less likely to miss loan repayments. They're less likely to visit the bank and so they're going to be gaining a significant um, cost saving from uh, not incurring those transaction costs. Um, so thank you very much. I'll, I'll finish there and I'll look forward to questions at the end. Thank you very much, Shima. Uh, so now we have uh, Paul Sirma. Paul, do you want to share your screen? And if you want to ask a question in the, in the Q&A, feel free to, to ask a question for Ima, Elijah, for, for everyone. And we'll come back to the question uh, toward the end of the session. Hi, uh, my name is Paul Simmer, and I'm a public policy PhD candidate at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And I'm here today to present my working paper titled The Effect of Unconditional Cash Transfers on Labor Allocation and Farm Productivity, Evidence from Malawi. I'll start by giving a quick overview of the Malawi Social Cash Transfer Program. This is a flagship social protection program in Malawi that is run by the government. It provides an unconditional cash transfer to the ultra poor and labor constrained households, and the transfer amount represents about 18% of households' baseline consumption. Currently, the program reaches about 8% of the population in all rural areas, which represent about uh, to uh, 293,000 households. The specific data I use comes from the impact evaluation of the expansion of this program in the two districts of Salima and Mangochi in Malawi. The impact evaluation team employed a clustered randomized control trial with a sample size of about 3,531 households who are mostly female-headed female households. This also come from 29 village uh, clusters. At baseline, randomization was successful and balance was achieved, and there's no evidence of selective attrition at end line. The baseline data was collected in 2013, and the end line data was collected in 2015. I'll first present descriptive evidence that transfers have led to labor adjustment. So figure one, I'm, I'm plotting a kind of density estimate of natural log of days in the past rainy season, that household reported working on their own farm. And at baseline, which is re represented by these two gray lines, we see, we see that the distribution of the uh, treatment group, which is represented by the solid line, is equivalent to that of the control group, which is represented by the, do by the do dotted line. Two years later, at end line, which are represented by the two red lines, we see that the distribution of the treatment group has shifted to the right of the control group, suggesting that transfers have led uh, uh, have led to more households to working more in their own farm. On the other hand, uh, in figure two, I'm reporting kind of density estimate of natural log of days in the last 12 months, household reported uh, uh, doing GANU or casual labor. Again, at baseline, the distribution of the treatment group and the control group are equivalent. But two years later, 
we see that the distribution of the, uh, of the treatment group has shifted to the left of the control group, suggesting that uh, treatment group are working are supplying less labor into gamma. To confirm this result, I'll estimate, I'll estimate the intention to treat impact on labor allocation using difference in differences. So table one confirmed the positive impact on own farm labor and the negative impact on GANU or casual labor. Column one and two uh, uses responses from the sample, uh, user responses uh, that was administered to a sample of household ages, household uh, ages six and, and older. And column three and four uses responses from uh, from the time use uh, survey module that was administered to individual ages 10 years and older. Column one shows uh, impact on, uh, on the natural log of days in the past rain, 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 rain season that household reported working on their own farm. And here I estimate the impact of about 27% relative to the control group who on average reported working about 94 days in the past rain season in their own farm. In column two, I, uh, I show impact, I show ITT impact on natural log of, hour, of hours uh, working during Ganyu in the, in the last seven days. And, uh, and in this column, I, I, I find impact of about 32% relative to the control group who on average put it working about 11 hours in the past seven days. In column three and four, using the, uh, the much more restrictive sample, in column three, I do not find any input at the extensive uh, of GANU labor where the household are doing any GANU. I do not find any difference between the treatment group and the control group. However, if we look at the intensity in which uh, household are doing GANU, I find evidence in support of, uh, of, of those I represented in column two that household are working less days uh, of Ganya, doing less day of Ganya. So taken take together, this, this result might suggest that the separation property of agricultural household model might not hold in my setting. And I test and confirm this, <laughs> and I show, that, um, I show that the number of sons and daughters that this, this household have correlate with, an, uh, with, an, with the amount of labor they demand on their own farm. So uh, in, this, uh, in this graph here, we can see that most of this uh, coefficient are statistically significant and very few of them cross the zero line, suggesting that demographic variables are associated with farm labor demand. And as, as such, uh, production consumption decision in my settings are not separable. And I do confirm this with the F test for joint significance in which I reject the null hypothesis that all these coefficients are zero. To try to understand this impact, uh, this impact, I first estimate uh, ITT impact on the physical input in which I do not detect any impact on land or the technology. For example, if we look at, at the log acres of land on, I do not find any statistical significance difference between the treatment and the control group. The same thing applies for the number of plots owned or cultivated. I do not detect any statistical significance difference between the two groups. And the same applies also to the, uh, where the household are using irrigated plots. However, I do find impact on the, on the variable input. So if we look at the low value of agricultural assets, I estimate that the impact of about 94% higher among the treatment group than among the control group. And if we look at low expenditure for seeds, I also find impact of about 102% higher among the treatment group relative to the control group. And the same applies to the log expenditure for fertilizers and manure. And if we scrutinize uh, to, to, to understand which, what type of flavors household use, we see that if, even though I, I, I detect impact on the use of hired labor, as at the extensive or the intensive margin, if we look at the, at the magnitude of the impact on these two uh, outcomes, they're economically insignificant compared to the magnitude of family labor, which suggests that households rely heavily on their own family labor. If we, com if we combine this investment in input, it happens to translate into higher output. So if we look at harvest, either log quantity of crop harvested or the log value of crop harvested, 
I detect impact. Uh, I detect impact of about uh, 56 percent. So, and I also estimate the margin of productivity of labor to look at uh, at this uh, allocative efficiency. And I find that using uh, Cobb Douglas production function, and I find that the margin of productivity of labor are about 1.4 times higher among the treatment group relative to the control group. So, but my, the policy implication of my results suggests that a simple program that provides an unconditional cash transfer directly to people leads to uh, allows house, households to allocate their resources more efficiently. And specifically in my setting, I see that households uses uh, invest uh, uses the transfer to invest in variable inputs such as seeds, fertilizer, and implement. These are the acts, the pandas that they need to cultivate the land. And they co combine this investment with most of their own labor to produce uh, more output. Even as the size of land and whether they're using uh, irrigation does not change. Thank you so much for listening. And if you have any comment or suggestion, please do not hesitate to reach me at my email. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, so we are now moving to our uh, last presentation. Uh, Mirko, do you want to start sharing your screen? Yes. Oh, dear, is this this again? Just a second. Seems that my laptop isn't happy. Let me tell you, you can you see my screen by now or not yet? Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, this is joint work with Olivier Sturk and Iman Chara, both colleagues at Oxford. And we are looking at the impact of food aid and refugee coping strategies using an RDD. So we have already heard from Elijah today that refugees are living in quite problematic situations, very often having to flee their home countries and living in other countries, not just for a couple of years, but sometimes many, many years in a row. Um, in so-called protracted situations where they're very often reliant on the service delivery from international organizations, most notably the UNHCR and the World Food Program. Now, unfortunately, given the world we live in, a lot of these organizations are faced with an ever-increasing need for their services, and that does usually imply a certain amount of funding shortages as well, since the amount of funding usually is quite fixed for the short term. Now, what very often happens in these sorts of situations is that funding or rather aid has to be withdrawn from certain populations in order to serve those who are the most in need. And one group that has their aid quite frequently reduced are in fact refugees who have been living in a country for several years already. The idea being there that very often those who have been living somewhere for a couple of years have through that time perhaps already become more self-reliant and therefore would have been more able to cope with a negative income shock, such as a reduction in their food rations. However, because we cannot really exogenously vary the amount of rations that are being taken away from individuals for obvious moral reasons, we so far really do not have a lot of empirical evidence as to what actually happens in these sorts of situations and whether these populations are able to cope with such negative shocks, even though it is actually a rather prominent policy. Our setting is quite unique in that it, in fact, allows us to say something about the negative impacts of food aid reductions um, by looking at a specific policy shock that happened in Uganda. What happened in particular is that in 2015, uh, there was a large outbreak of violence in South Sudan, and therefore many refugees from South Sudan came into Uganda, which is the study of our setting. So because of the sudden influx of refugees into Uganda, WFP, suddenly faced a reduction, basically a shortage in their funding and had to reduce racial entitlements to specific refugee populations. And they did so by using a cutoff rule such that all refugees who arrived before 2013 saw their rations reduced by 50% and all who arrived after 2013 were deemed to have been more recent arrivals and perhaps more in need and they remained eligible for the full ration. And that sort of discontinuity is one that we are going to exploit in our regression discontinuity design. In caloric contents, the differences are also quite stark, as in the caloric content fell from 2,400 kilocalories per adult per day down to just around 1,100. When we look into the discontinuity in terms of ration sizes, 
Here I have two graphs, which are parts of the ration contents. On one side, there is maize on the left hand, and on the other side, there are the beans that individuals have received. And as you can see, those who have arrived after 2013, on average, have around twice the amount of the ration in the ration than individuals who arrived before 2013. This sort of discontinuity can be very useful in estimating causal, causal, causal impacts, um, such that what we can do is, in essence, reduce the effective amounts of observations that we are interested in to some observations who are just to the left-hand side of the cutoff and some who are just to the right-hand side of the cutoff. And if no other variable has, in that same time frame, made a discontinuous jump around 2013, then those two groups should be more or less comparable in an intuitive setting. And the difference between the two treatment, the treatment, the control group can therefore be used to estimate in rough terms, the causal impact. In econometrics terms, it's a little bit more complicated, but the intuition sort of stands. So we have quite a couple of reasons to expect that in fact, no other variable had a discontinuous jump. One thing that we are very often quite worried in RDDs is that subjects are able to anticipate the policy and therefore change their response to it. Now in our setting, that is very hard or even impossible because the cutoff was set to 2013, but the policy actually came into effect in 2015. So this means that individuals who arrived in 2013, they couldn't anticipate a policy that would be implemented two years in the future. And therefore they wouldn't be able to shift, for example, into the treatment group rather than to the control group by delaying their arrival by just a couple of days, but they arrived as they arrived and then the cutoff was set retrospectively and that gives us a sort of plausible exogenous variation in their arrival. In addition, the policy was unexpected and that not just the individuals arriving did not expect the policy, but also when it came into effect in 2015, it wasn't a response to a sudden influx of refugees from South Sudan which in itself was a response to sudden outbreaks of violence within the country. It was unexpected by both the governments as well as the World Food Program in Uganda at that time. Um, and therefore there wasn't any endogenous anticipation of a policy, but it came rather unexpected for all parties involved. Um, finally, what we could be worried about is that since the policy was triggered by an influx of refugees, it could be that the arrivals of South Sudanese refugees have impacted our study setting um, in other ways than just through the food policy. However, as I'll be telling you in the data section just in a second, our data set comes from Nakivala Refugee Settlement, which is located in Uganda South. And the whole influx of refugees into Uganda actually was limited to Uganda's North. Hardly any South Sudanese refugees arrived into our refugee camp um, so that their impacts would have really not been, would be more geographically limited geographically limited to the north and would not be directly impacting, for example, the labor markets in Nakibale. With this being said, it is then possible to use a regression as continuity design. We use a fuzzy one because there have been very few exceptions for extremely vulnerable individuals and use standard econometric techniques such as non-parametric local linear regressions. And we cluster standard errors at the enumeration error level such that we can account for the survey design. We use data as set from Nakivale, which is one of Uganda's largest refugee camps, and was collected between March and April 2018. We have in total 1509, uh, 15, around 1,600 refugees from the two main refugee nationalities that are present within Nakivale. Those are Somali and Congolese refugees. The data is um, representative of the refugee population within Nakivale and also representative of the two subnationalities the Somalis and the Congolese. What do we find is the following. Um, we find, so our preferred specification is in panel B as it also controls for a couple of demographics such as gender, age, marital status, and education. We find a, a, perhaps one point also an interpretation of the results. Um, we align with the RDD literature in that the treatment group is at the that we compare the right-hand side of the cutoff to the left-hand side of the cutoff. Now, if you remember before, the right-hand side of the cutoff are individuals who arrived after 2013 and they're actually part of the control group. And those on the left-hand side of the cutoff are in the treatment group. So in this case, if we have a positive coefficient here, it just means that the control group actually has a higher outcome than the treatment group. Um, now, what we find is that 
individuals who have been affected by ration cuts have a significant reduction in their caloric consumption. But actually, if we convert the coefficients, it's around 36% or 513 kilocalories per capita per day. We also find that food expenditure also falls by a very similar margin, around 35 percentage percent. And that is quite interesting because it means that actually expenditure and calor cal calories are not substitutes, but rather complements. So it seems that individuals not only reduce their caloric consumption, they also reduce their spending that they have on calories. And one thing that we do observe in the camps, especially among Somalis, that might explain this is that individuals also quite frequently sell their rations. So in this case, rations that are being sold can also function as a sort of income source. Thus, when rations are reduced, income is reduced and therefore also spending can be reduced. We find also an increased food insecurity, such that if rations are reduced, then food insecurity increases by around five points on the FIA scale. And we find that those who have been affected by ration cuts, in fact, travel a little bit less. So it seems that outmigration isn't as much of a problem in our context. And it is more the individuals who already have the means who are in the control group who are more likely to travel than individuals who are in the treatment group. Interestingly, we do not find any effect on dietary variety, health, or the likelihood of having a job working in any sort of field. And especially this last result has been quite interesting for us because we would have expected individuals to substitute their lost income um, or at least calories in some way by, for example, seeking new employment opportunities. And it could be the case that the job markets within the settlements are very tight, which is something we observe in many refugee settlements. Or it could be also the case that there are underlying differences in the refugee populations that actually drive the effect to be closer to zero. In investigating the second one, we split the sample into the two main subsamples that we have, which are the Somali and the Congolese. And there are some reasons why we could believe that the impacts both on calories, but also on the job um, dummy are different for the two subsamples. And that is because those two have a very different background. Congolese refugees, or let's say the Somali refugees, let's start here, actually have a urban background, which means that when they come into camp and if they receive an allocated plot of land that they could use for agriculture, they're not suited to do that. But instead they prefer to move into the settlement and actually do typical settlement jobs such as um, trade services, etc. Congolese refugees are the opposite. They tend to have an urban background. And when they are allocated a plot of land, which is actually a standard aid practice within Nakivale, they are able to also use the land to produce agricultural output. And in fact, agriculture is the most pro prominent um, type of employment opportunity for these refugees. Therefore, for example, if they're able to allocate, to use agriculture to produce more food to balance their negative income shock, that could be an effect we might have expected. Interestingly enough, it is not what we in fact found because the impact on calories is actually larger for Congolese refugees than for Somali refugees. Um, the before significant effect is now very large um, such that Congolese refugees who are affected by cuts actually have a much reduced caloric consumption. Um, and for Somali refugees, the impact is actually somewhat smaller and even insignificant although the coefficient is still very similar in size, it's just the standard error that increased because of the smaller sample size. Um, there's another thing that is very interesting about the Somali results on dietary variety, and that is that in fact, we find here that Somalis that have been affected by ration cuts have more varied, varied diets and also less health problems. And we will get into this in a second. Um, it is just something to worth noting. Finally, on the job dummy, we see, as we sort of expected, a different in sign in that Somalis, when they're affected by ration reductions, they're less likely to be working, whilst Congolese refugees are much more likely to be working. And therefore, Congolese refugees seem to be substituting um, lost income with seeking new employment opportunities. Somali refugees, however, are seeming to do something different. And what that might be, we'll see in a second. Just to recap that section for a second, we observed a couple of oddities. On one hand, the effect on weekly calories was significantly higher for the Congolese refugees than for Somalis, even though they are able to use agricultural land. Then dietary variety is higher and the number of health problems lower for Somalis on reduced rations. Somalis on reduced rations are also less likely to work, whilst employment um, is, however, a coping strategy for the Congolese refugees. 
We now look into some more detail in, on the Somali and the Congolese results to see how we can explain these sorts of findings. And for the Somalis, what we also know is that they are very often strongly connected within a community, within the settlement, but also not just within Akivale itself, but also Uganda as a whole, and also with other countries. So we looked at the remittances that Somalis receive and wanted to see if whether we see an increase in the remittances received, both on the extensive and intensive margin. And we do see, in fact, that Somalis who are affected by racial reductions are significantly more likely to receive remittances in the last month. Also, the amount received is quite large, although the standard error is also quite large. And therefore, overall, the effect seems insignificant, but the direction goes into what we would have expected. Interestingly enough as well, the dietary variety seems to be explained by the sorts of foods that refugees consume. Um, what we see is that Somalis, who tend to have a very meat-rich diet and prefer to eat meat over other types of foods, when they are affected by ration reductions, they significantly reduce their consumption of meat, which is also a much more expensive type of food. Instead, they tend to consume or are shifted more towards the sorts of foods that are included within the ration themselves, which are beans, nuts, maize, cereals, and potatoes. So what happens in, for them, what we can sort of tell from the data is that on one hand, they're able to balance the shock through remittances. On the other hand, they're able to do it through shifting the consumption of the goods um, away from the culturally preferred ones that are more expensive and into those who are included within the rations who are less expensive, but at the same time, they're also more varied and they also have a higher caloric content per gram which would explain the sorts of results that we saw before on the smaller impact on calories and also the positive impacts on dietary variety. For Congolese refugees, we saw that employment was a very important coping strategy for them. Congolese, when they were affected by ration reductions, were significantly more likely to take on new job opportunities. The interesting question was, on whether they continue to expand on the employment that they had within agriculture or whether they seek out new job opportunities. And what we find is that, in fact, the whole effect of employment comes entirely from non-agricultural work. And one thing that actually was happening during the camp um, in Akivale through many, many years is that as more and more refugees were coming to the camp, and refugees were allocated a new plot of land, they, at some point, there was pressure on the amount of land that could be allocated. That meant that refugees were sometimes, sometimes land allocations were happening and plots that were already allocated had to be reallocated. And what that means very often for investment is that there is an incentive to use the land as much as possible in a short amount of time and a disincentive to invest into the plot of land um, because it is never really, a security whether this land is all still going to stay within your holding for the longer foreseeable future. And because of that, land has over many years in Akivale degraded to the point where it seems that agriculture has become more less and less of a sustainable employment field. And now faced with a negative income shock, individuals are even more incentivized to perhaps shift away from agriculture into other job market opportunities. Um, and therefore we see an increase in and the likelihood of taking those on. You have about like one or two minutes left, but we, we are quite flexible on time. Since, uh, we are on the last okay. slide, so wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, we saw that refugee communities adopt different coping strategies. Somalis who had low refrigerations, they consumed on average fewer preferred food items and they substituted them with items that were cheaper, but also richer in calories, and therefore they have a better varied, varied diet. Somalis are in tend to be also better connected. Um, and therefore, when the effect of liberation cuts, they can rely on their remittances network to balance a negative income shock. Congolese do not have usually such a network. And instead, they increase their labor supply and that labor supply tends to come from non-agricultural work, um, which have become, as agricultural work jobs have become less and less sustainable over time due to decreasing land availability and land quality. We do a couple of robustness checks, which are not going through. And to conclude, we saw that refugees who are subject to ration cuts experience significant declines in their caloric intake and also food expenditures. They're also more food insecure. 
However, when interpreting these results, it's very important to look at the cultural context and look at the nationalities included, um, as we see that the types of coping can vary very much between those two nationalities. We saw that for Somalis, they actually prefer to substitute preferred food items with cheaper ones, and therefore increase their variety and also caloric intake. Although they're probably not very happy because they had to, it's not a net positive effect because they actually have probably higher disutility by doing so. And Congolese refugees on the other hand, um, were, would not be able to rely on their remittances network, but instead they went to increase their labor supply in jobs that were more sustainable. All in all, self-reliance did not seem to be fully achieved in the long run. Both populations have been affected in various ways. Um, and I think I will stop on this point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mirko. And thank you to uh, all the, the panelists for these great uh, presentations. So we're gonna now open the, the floor to, to questions and uh, have like, uh, we have about half an hour for, for discussions. So if you want to ask question, you can either raise your hand, then I can um, uh, like allow you to, to speak, uh, or just type in your um, your question in the in the discussion part or the Q and A uh, section. So uh, and of course the panelists are also uh, encouraged to also ask questions to uh, to each other. So there is a question by Marwa. Marwa, do you want to? Uh, do you want to uh, ask your question directly? You should be able to unmute now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. My question is for Mirko. I was wondering what he would attribute the strength of the, of the Somali network to? What factors, based on observation or based on his reading, what he thinks are the factors that cause the Somalis to have a stronger network vis-a-vis -vis the Congolese? Um, just any thoughts on that would be helpful. Thank you. Sure, thank you very much. Um, I think the most blunt answer would be it is cultural to a very large degree. What we see both in Uganda and also in some other projects in Kenya is that Somalis tend to, as in general, um, be better connected with other individuals. So this on one hand means Somalis are, tend to be more likely to travel to other places and establish other business ties over there. In addition, the community itself is very tight knit. So when you have a community that is very connected with each other and at the same time, many individuals travel to different places and they still upkeep those sorts of connections, um, you get a network that the Somalis very often rely on. I think what also helps is that Somalis very often, at least in this context, are urban. Um, that means they have in their skill set the sorts of traits and knowledge that they need to succeed in urban environments a bit better than, for example, Congolese refugees who are very rural. Therefore, they are more able to go to new places and new cities and actually engage in job market opportunities over there. And they're also, because they're able to engage, more likely to go, if that makes sense. Um, the fact that they are very strongly connected to their community and keep up these connections, however, to my knowledge, is culture. And I wouldn't be able to find a more precise factor that would go into it. I hope this in part explains the question. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so uh, feel free to ask any question if you have uh, one. I'm gonna, in the meantime, I'm gonna use my uh, power of the chair to ask one question, which I think could could apply maybe to Elijah, but also uh, maybe to Paul. Uh, I mean, in a sense, I think if if, you, if I understand correctly you, your two papers, you are kind of looking at the effect of cash transfer program on uh, either like labor market outcomes, in a sense, whether people are able to use the, um, the cash transfer to, uh, whether they work more and whether they're able to use the cash transfer to make like investment. But I think if I, understand correctly um, this literature on cash transfer, one of the very important aspects is also food security and, uh, and like poverty level in a sense. Uh, and especially with, uh, for you, Elijah, since you are testing, like you are comparing like two interventions where in, in the one hand you give like a big lump sum cash transfer and in the other end you are doing like monthly regular uh, payments. And so I wonder whether you are also looking at 
food security and also consumption smoothing in a sense, because maybe my intuition would be that big lump sum cash transfer will be better for investment, but maybe regular transfer will be better for food security or for like consumption uh, smoothing. So maybe Elijah, if you want to start, and maybe Paul would be great to have your, um, your thought on that as well. Question. Uh, yes, indeed, we look at uh, um, but we don't see much difference apart from short term uh, changes when you give a lump sum versus when you give in uh, uh, in installments. So because we don't have a control a control group. Uh, then we can't say is it because of um, is it because of uh, the cash transfer itself, or uh, is it because of the increasing? But if we compare a higher amount versus a smaller amount, uh, the effects are the same, especially in the long run. So everybody is increasing food security situation. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your question. This actually is a really interesting question. And actually, in our uh, in our development policy review journal, which I co-authored uh, with Handa and Ochera, we, we, we did report uh, impact on this broad indices of consumption, food security, asset, subjective well-being. And we found impact on all this broad, uh, broad uh, indices. And we also did estimate uh, uh, it, we also estimate the multiplier effect, and we found that for every uh, for every quarter transfer, it get, uh, it led to a generation of about three additional quarter. So uh, we we have this re result in our uh, in our other papers. Uh, okay, thank you uh, so much to both of you. Um, I have a question for you. Uh, Emma, uh, because I, I'm I'm working on similar things where you are we are doing like information campaign and, and stuff like that, and I and I think one question I have is like what the limit of of doing that in a sense in, in the sense here you are using like uh, you are like uh, using your new method to call people and ask them to, uh, to and give them information about the new technology, but you could also do that for I don't know like. Um, give them information on contraceptive use, give them information on uh, some particular preventive health measures, uh, some other bank products. So in a sense, what's, do you have a, um, what's your opinion about like, what's the limit of this type of program? And also, can you say something about that using your data? Because in a sense, if I understand correctly, you've made like many, many different attempts to find this, uh, these people. And so could you use that as like, a, I mean, to have like some variation in the number of attempts to see at, at which point people stop to, to pick their, their phone. I mean, if, if I take my case personally, when a cell phone company is calling me to ask me to buy their new products, at some point, I'm not gonna pick the, the product call again. Yeah, definitely. I think um, our context is quite important for answering that question because we, the way the calls went out is that they, the number like appeared as from our bank's partner, Opportunity International. And so when the clients got the call, it wasn't sort of just this call coming from a random number that could have been a spam call. It like very much was set up as like, this is a call from the bank. And so I think that kind of call is going to be quite different to, I think how IVR messages could be used, which is just to like bombard people with kind of spam calls about any topic you thought they might be interested in um, and hope they picked up. So. I think our context is, is going to have quite like higher compliance with the messages and higher interest in the messages because these were already clients um, of the bank and we were telling them about a service that was very useful to them, was very new and they might not have heard about before. And particularly because this happened during the COVID pandemic, like there was a COVID angle um, to it that I didn't have time to go into too much, but trying to encourage them to use digital technologies instead of physically traveling to the bank as well. So I think it was quite um, like a time where these messages were very, very useful to the clients. I think you would have to be careful to just like randomly dial people's phones and start sending them messages. I don't think it necessarily would be very effective. And in terms of the um, 
I guess other diminishing returns to more calls, we sent out about 10 calls. I think on average, people listen to just under four of them. Um, and so we definitely do see um, a sort of leveling off in the impact. It seems like somewhere between three and five calls is when you get the, the sort of uh, maximum treatment effects really um, from, from these calls and beyond kind of four or five, you don't really get much additional impact in terms of use of mobile banking. So I think we definitely didn't need to send um, 10 and very, very few people listen to all 10. But I think that did actually help us in, in making sure that people listen to a few different messages. The messages were designed to be quite self-contained. So it's not that if you missed the second one and heard the third one, it wouldn't make any sense to you. Like you could still just listen to them independently. Um, so I think by sending more messages, we did ensure that people heard a few of them, even if they didn't listen to everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Victor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I have like a few questions for you, Mirko, um, and one additional question for you, Paul. So Mirko, maybe, I mean, maybe I'm misreading that, but if like for, I think one of your subsample, uh, like the reduction in the size of the uh, food ration uh, had like a, a positive effect on food diversity. And so is one way to read this result that maybe the, the, the type of food that is distributed is not good enough or it's not the good, the good one or is it that they are like selling it and that and, I, and like how are they, is it possible that they are able to optimize on, in, on that dimension? Uh, when they receive like a fewer amount of food. That's something Let me that see. Like um, so the finding that we had is that when rations are reduced, what does happen is that food diversity, so that's for Somalis only, when rations are reduced, what happens is that food diversity goes up. Um, and a lot of con cultural context goes into this in a sort. One could make the argument that rations and their contents are not culturally appropriate for Somalis which is correct because much of the things that are included in the rations is not the type of food that Somalis would generally speaking enjoy consuming. And perhaps an improvement in this direction would be positive. Um, we see this argument more in the sense that Somalis, because of it, routinely do sell their rations in order to gain cash, in order to buy the sorts of foods that they are more enjoy, enjoying to eat. One problem with it is that what they do enjoy eating is meat a lot and uh, meat tends to be a lot more expensive than other types of foods. Now, and also in, on average, a little bit less calor um, calorically diverse, or let's say they then basically consume proteins and not many other different types of foods and uh, therefore their, their diet tends to be less diverse. Now, when rations are reduced, that means the reduced cash flow for Somalis. And perhaps also it means that they are not as able to consume the types of food that they would normally consume that are more expensive. So what they are left with is, for example, the contents of the rations that they can consume without selling, or they also substitute through actually buying the types of foods that are included in the ration, which are cheaper, which are, however, more diverse because they are, in, they are beans, they are mazes, they have different types of vegetables, um, and they shift away from the food that they would culturally prefer to eat towards food that has more calories and is also a bit more diverse. That is sort of what we find in our data. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. And I, but I mean, on this like heterogeneity of the result, I had like a, a question. I mean, have you look at other dimension? Is it like, because in a sense, um, uh, I think this day what most people would do is to do like uh, some, uh, uh, like use machine learning techniques to look at what's the best, what are the most important uh, dimension of heterogeneity. And so is it something that you cannot measure and so you have to use this different nationality or is it like different characteristics of the population from the different uh, nationality that are the most important? I mean, maybe you are able to do that in the paper. I, I don't know. We actually haven't looked into the batting into machine learning yet here, which would be actually something interesting to look into now for what it. Um, we've gone for nationalities primarily because I personally, and also in the team, we think that is a very important policy angle to have. Um, because very often when policies are implemented, um, the nationality and the, the context tends to be not looked into as much as it could perhaps be important. 
um, and looking into how different nationalities do implement uh, their coping strategies has for us been informative and I think is also for the paper. Um, could there be other angles apart from nationality that are interesting? For certain. And I think that would be a great point to also make and tell for the entire. So we all look into it. Uh, thank you. And uh, and finally for you, uh, Paul, I have like um, a question on um, on your study. I think if I understand correctly, in a sense, you are you find like a positive effect on uh, I mean agricultural input and uh, and things like that of your cash transfer uh, program. I mean, in a sense, can you uh, would it be possible using your data to kind of uh, try to test whether people are credit constrained? And what are like the returns to capital in your in your in your context? Because I think, in a sense, it would be interesting to compare what are the returns to capital for this type of transfer in your particular context to all this literature that look, for example, at returns to capital for small firms or in a, in other contexts or for all type of other types of, uh, of investment. I don't know if it, if it's something you can uh, you can do with your with your data. I think certainly that's an, an interesting angle that I could explore further in this in my working paper. I think uh, testing uh, whether people are credit constrained, we have some uh, questions in the survey module where we try to get at that question, like asking people whether they were, they were able to borrow and whether they could borrow. Uh, so we have those questions that I think I, I can try to uh, to create a few indicators for how credit constrained households are and see whether the more credit constrained household have uh, have, uh, have larger impact. And on the second question to measure uh, the return to capital in this, uh, the to capital in this uh, context, I think uh, that is definitely worth exploring and something that I'll adapt in my uh, iteration of this paper. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you, uh, have any other question for uh, other panelists, or is there anyone in the um, uh, who's not a panelist who want to to ask a question? Yes, I I, I, I had a quick question to Miko. Uh, I really like this uh, nationality angle, but I, I was just wondering whether you have any information on language spoken because uh, the Congolese might have uh, language words might be more uh, like they might be able to speak Swahili as uh, people in Uganda, therefore they might be able to find uh, work opportunities. And I was just wondering whether you had any information on language and whether it's worth pursuing. We haven't looked into the angle in extensive detail yet, so I can't give you the exact data for it, but it's definitely something interesting to check. Um, language can be one barrier. Education actually can also be another barrier because very often certificates are missing and it's very hard to then prove any sort of education that you have, which is important in the job market. Um, and another limitation that we more often see um, is um, the connections that you have in the camp, because Congolese refugees tend to be sort of more rural than the Somali refugees. They, on one hand, it's a skill question of whether you can find employment within. Um, on the other hand, ties within the camps are also quite important in securing. We had some data showing that a large fraction of refugees who are employed tend to be employed by refugees of the same nationality. So being connected with your own nationality and that nationality already being present within the camp is very often an important predictor. And that would in some way then also solve the language problem or it might be caused by the language problem. Um, definitely something that we can look into because we do have the data and I'll make a note of it. So thank you very much. And there is a question by Paul. Uh, Paul, do you want to ask a question for, for Emma? Sure, yeah. Hi, hi Emma. Um, I think I just wanted to ask a hopefully quite a straightforward question. But in talking about the benefits of IVR, you mentioned how you know it's a great tool to reach illiterate rural populations. But you know the goal of this is to, I guess, increase sort of access to financial technologies like mobile banking. You know, do you have a sense of how accessible these technologies are for illiterate populations to kind of maybe speak towards the or sort of emphasize this benefit a little more concretely. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. That's a really, really great question. Um, so I think in speaking to how easy um, mobile banking is for literate populations, I also need to speak to the idea of um, mobile money used by literate populations. And I should note that a lot of people, even if they're 
um, illiterate and would struggle to read messages, they often use services like mobile money by effectively like memorizing the, the numbers that you key into the keypad to like do certain transactions. So you would memorize the number that you dial for mobile money and then you would memorize like option one is to send money and option two is to like receive money and, and that that kind of thing. And so mobile banking is, is operates in exactly the same way that it will have like a set number that you dial to like access the mobile banking menu. And then it's the same thing where you can sort of memorize that you do option one to like send money to the bank and option two to withdraw money from the bank. So even people who might be illiterate or have varying degrees of illiteracy would still be able to to use mobile banking services in a similar way to how they often use mobile money and in this population in ghana 95 percent of people are using mobile money so there definitely shouldn't be any additional barriers to using mobile banking that that you wouldn't also face with mobile money services and so i think that's going to make it um there will be more challenges obviously if you're um illiterate and, and understanding um initially how to use the service but um receiving the voice messages and then being able to to key in the numbers on your phone is still going to be possible for someone who's illiterate so thank, thank you, you. So thank you very much thank you okay thank you very much uh do you have any uh other questions uh a question um for elijah if that's okay yes perfect um, I was wondering, Elijah, I think from the way you um, ran your specification, you like pulled across the midline and end line for the group that got the small cash transfer amount in like two tranches. And so the other cash transfer groups are basically being compared to this kind of pooled midline and end line um, impact of the small um, two tranche cash transfer. But I wondered if that might cause difficulties because you're trying to detect these sort of nuanced differences between different ways of sending cash transfers that because you're pulling the midterm and end line for effectively the control group that that might dilute your ability to detect impacts at the midline for the other treatment arms and so you might want to include in your specification a dummy variable basically capturing end line for the control group such that you're then comparing all the other treatment arms to the the midline of the control group, not to this like pooled midline and end line of the control group. Yeah, uh, thanks for that suggestion. Yeah, I think we in 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 the specification we have uh, we we have a dummy that is taking care of uh, the control group progress over time. Okay, so you already maybe I, I didn't include in the slide. Yeah. Yeah, okay, then that then then don't worry about that suggestion. I just didn't realize that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Any uh, last minute question? Okay, great. So um, I'm gonna uh, end this session now. I'm gonna uh, thank you all for your uh, your great presentation. Uh, and uh, and thank you uh, all the uh, those who attended this uh, this uh, this session. Uh, I think we can meet uh, now in uh, in Gazertown for more like uh, informal talks. Uh, is it now or is it tomorrow morning? I think it's now. Uh, uh, okay, so anyway, uh, thank you so much for uh, for your your time and for the the great talk. Uh, and uh, and see you uh, tomorrow and uh, in Gather Town or in uh, other sessions uh, tomorrow and uh, and on Friday. Thank you so much.